And so as I've been mentioning, we are preaching a series called Follow, and it's all about community. And the heart of the sermon series is around this idea of we need to move from me to we. And this idea that we are always going to be so much better in community. And the idea around this is if you read through the New Testament, uh, you're not going to find the word Christian uh, very often. In fact, it is very seldomly used once or twice. But the word that is used more regularly in the New Testament is this idea of a disciple. And the word disciple is used. And this idea is Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. And together they followed the way of Jesus, the life of Jesus, put that into practice, following him in community. And this is what we are. We are following Jesus together. We are a community. Remember, the idea is a church is not a building. A building is where a church gathers for logistical purposes, but the church is the gathering of disciples who follow Jesus, follow his ways, follow his words, and put that into practice as we live out and bring the kingdom here on earth. But the whole world gets community to some degree. I mean, I think of the community that gathers at Reed Play at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. It's this crazy thing. Uh, nearly a thousand or just over a thousand people at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, first day of the weekend, to run or walk five kilometers. That many people doing something like that is, is mind boggling. And, and sometimes nearly 400, 500,000 worldwide because it creates a place of community. How many of you have been a part of a social club of some form? Squash club, a paddle, like a social indoor soccer league, a book club, a knitting club, a you know, running, being part of a club? Yeah, a whole bunch of hands going up. Most of the hands in the room, we've been part of community. And, and there's some really interesting things about this because, in fact, Harvard's longest ever medical study has been done around this idea of community in nearly 75 years. And I'll get to that study in a moment. But This idea of community is so central to what it means to follow Jesus. Here's some interesting studies that have come out um, in, in, in looking at this idea of community. And the first one was by a Canadian doctor. And this one might seem a little bit funny to you. You might have seen the picture when it popped up uh, on the screen. But this guy called Dr. Bruce Alexander looked at the effects of drugs and community. And so one of the ways that they tested the effects of drugs was with rats. And so the experiment was they would give them two uh, sources of water. One just pure uh, H2O, normal good water, and the other one was a mixture of either heroin or cocaine. And the rats would be in their little tiny rat cages, given these two sources of water. And in isolation, the rats would drink the uh, drug affected water till they died. They were just nonstop and they OD'd. But then Dr. Bruce Alexander, he was like, well, hang on, maybe it's not the drugs, maybe it's the environment. And so in the 70s, he developed this concept called Rat Park. And so what he did was, is he took the rats out of their little cages And he created a more ideal environment where they can have proper interaction with other rats, decent living conditions where they could free to be what a rat is and can do. But still, they had the same two water sources, the pure H2O and the drug-infused water. And guess what happened every single time? The rats did not drink the water that was filled with the drugs. So then they took the rats out again, and they took a rat that had been in that social environment, put it back into the cage, back with the two water sources, and it went straight to the drug water and died, and would rather die than be alone. And what they then found was when they put the rats back in, and they had been on the drugs, but hadn't died yet, the other rats helped it wean it off by protecting it and giving it the other pure water to drink. And what they found in Rat Park was that social connections had the power to beat drug addiction. The Beatles 
kind of said the same thing. What was their famous song in the lyrics? All you need is love. That the medical world looking in and actively studying community found the positive effects that a community can have on health and a positive outlook on life. Again, another incredible study uh, that has been come to be known as the Rosetto Effect. The Rosetto Effect was a study done after a town in Pennsylvania named after Rosetto. Long history of the town, Italian migrant workers in the 1800s eventually settled there. So these were all Italian Americans by descent. And they realized doing trials and studies across the whole of America that this tiny little town had um, a crazy stat around heart disease. In fact, they were sitting at less than half of America's national average around heart disease. And especially in like your like critical, most at risk people. And when they started to look at it, now they're investigating everything. There's no lower uh, stats around like obesity and any other health things. They're not like healthy. There was nothing that set them apart from uh, the way they lived from a health point of view, and they couldn't understand why it was the lowest uh, town with heart medication, heart attacks, heart disease, in fact, less than half. And so they did an active study here and found that the only thing that set this town apart was the interrelational connections. And not just family, they had strong family times, but it was neighbors. It was how neighbors loved neighbors and showed up when people were in need how streets would get together and connect and and have like backyard um, bras and and dinners where they would just invite people and how they loved each other in community, the medical profession had to write and go, we need to think differently about health. And again, this is not knocking the medical profession, but they had to conclude from this study that interpersonal relationships had a direct impact on the longevity of people living in this town and their physical heart condition was better because of how good their personal relationships were. Malcolm Gladwell in his famous book, Outliers, even comments on the Rosetta effect where he talks and he actually makes this quote, the high quality of interpersonal relationships was the reason for the Rosettans' long and happy lives. Community having a direct impact on people's well-being and their health. I mentioned Harvard's longest study, 75 years, uh, nearly 800 people. And again, just looking at health and what sets people's health apart. Not money, not fame, not possessions, nothing. But the summary of this was the deterioration in a person's health, the older that they got, was directly linked to how alone they were. And if somebody battled to form personal relationships or lived in isolation, the older they got, the more rapidly their health deteriorated. And the adverse was true. The more people were in community, the better their health was, the better their mind was, the older they got, and the longer they lived. And in fact, the guy who published the study, Dr. Weldinger, said personal connection creates emotional stimulation, which is an automatic mood booster, while isolation is a mood buster. Community is so vital to every single person. And this has got nothing to do with extroverts or introverts or even thinking like that. This is so much more than that, that we are hardwired as people to be experiencing life in community. Think of the language that the Bible uses when it talks about the church. The main metaphor that the Bible gives us for church is a body. And again, it's Analogies are helpful and we must never take them too far, but a body works best as a connected whole. Now just track with me on this. If I decide to remove my foot and I put my foot on the side and go, you are on your own, okay, what happens to that foot? Okay, it rots and it dies. What happens to the rest of my body, both of us are no longer ever gonna be the same again. And humor me with this. The foot goes, Craig, you're not as light as what you used to be. 
You don't understand how sore I am at the end of the day having to carry all the weight that you have. We weren't the same when we started out. This isn't a fair relationship anymore. You are being cruel to me. Either way, are we better off removing ourselves from each other? And in any way, and again, it's just an analogy, but you can see the value of community. And I use this um, as an example because community is not always easy. And sometimes community gets very hard. And this is the difference between what we are trying to do as the body of Christ versus a running club or a squash club. Because a squash club, you can be part of a squash club for 20 years and never know anything other than the guy you regularly play with's name. You can feel part of community, but that community has not changed you. Where we, as a community, as we follow Jesus, are being transformed into his image. Think of what Paul said in in 2 Corinthians, and we who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory with ever-increasing measure which comes from the Spirit. We are about transformation. Joseph Hellerman uh, writes a lot about spiritual formation, but this is one of his big quotes, and it seems very bold. But he says, spiritual formation can only happen in community. I hear that. Spiritual formation, me becoming more like Jesus, can only happen in community. Think of um, the work of the Spirit in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. How do I develop patience if I am alone? And if I keep myself in isolation, how do I become more patient? And if the only person that I ever interact with is myself, how do I learn to be kind? How do I learn to be gentle? The Spirit and the work of the Spirit in terms of transformation and maturity and becoming like Christ, it cannot happen if I am not in a community with other people trying to do the same thing. In fact, it is impossible for me to mature, to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus if I am not in community. Again, think of marriage. For those of you who are married, you will know what I'm talking about here because marriage really is a a micro community of itself, but it does mirror what we're talking about here. I'll talk uh, with the permission of my wife. She allowed me to share some of this. Yeah, (laughs) thanks. I thought I was a really mature guy who had it all together when I was getting married. Okay, I thought I was mature, I thought that I was this really great guy until I had to share a bedroom, a bathroom, a house. Because here's the thing, right? In community, there are levels at which people get to see into your life. And you are able to prepare for when you gauge and go into community as to what people see and what people don't see. They say, love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. Because I started to realize, actually, there's so much I have not dealt with in my life. The level of selfishness that was actually living in my heart that I was unaware of that only got exposed while I'm now sharing my time, my money, my space with someone who I actually desired and loved more than anything. And so even with someone like that, it exposed things in my life and it was vice versa. And then we had a child. And just once we thought we had matured and sorted all our stuff out, the Lord brought another child, and the whole process starts again. But my ability to mature through all of those has happened because I was not alone, but because I was in a community where someone could see me for who I was and see all of me. And that brought about growth and change and transformation, which is why spiritual growth cannot happen in isolation. For us to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus, it has to happen in community. Now, I'm aware, and and this is important, because this idea that the church community is perfect is, is really far from the truth 
And in our midweek gatherings, in our life groups, we've been speaking about community. And one of the passages is the high water mark. And I'm just going to very, it's not going to be on the screen. I'm going to read it briefly. It's Acts 2. And if you've been tracking with us, and, and you can also go online and find some of that stuff, this is kind of like the high water mark. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We see a glimpse of church community, and it's incredible but because human beings are involved, this didn't unfortunately last very long. And so, for example, the gospel moves, uh, different towns are uh, having churches and people are starting to gather as the people are taking the gospel from town to town. And even some of the amazing church leaders that we read about in the New Testament are at the forefront of starting these churches. Think about the Apostle Paul, who we owe uh, most of our New Testament letters to writing and, and so much of what was done um, by him. And one of the church that he started was in a town called Corinth. And so if you know your Bibles well, one and two Corinthians were letters that he wrote to a church that he started there. And I don't know how much you know about the church in Corinth. So Paul starts it, great. He leaves and he gets word of some stuff that's happening in this church. Now, Many of you, you only know this church because it's the only church you've ever been a part of. Uh, just because of uh, my, my life, I've been maybe a part of, I was trying to think, like four churches for a significant period of time. And, and so I've experienced a lot in, in the lives of a local church. But here's some of the stuff that was just dominating this church. There was serious open division um, amongst the people as to who was leading and who were leaders in the church. But like really hectic open division. Believers were taking each other to court over disputes. So members of the church taking each other to court. There was significant open sexual immorality. And uh, the way they did communion was they would have a meal together. People at communion were getting drunk publicly, whilst other people were not getting anything at all because uh, they were not sharing with people. That sounds like a pretty hectic local church. They are going through a lot. That doesn't look like Acts 2. But you know what? There's still a community. And the most striking thing about Paul's letter, and, and uh, he's not condoning the sin, he's not glossing over the sin, but in everything that's going on in that letter, he writes this to them. And in fact, it's the last sentence of his letter to them after he's dealt with all of the things in this letter. So it's 1 Corinthians 16 24, and it is, it is striking, and it says this, it's up on the screen, my love to all of you in Christ Jesus, amen. Just my love to all of you in Christ Jesus, amen. Not close your doors, you useless reprobates. I am tired of your nonsense. I'm done with you. It's better off that we do not gather anymore. You have failed me. I'm disappointed in you. No. In all of their brokenness, in all of the pain that they're causing, in all of their messed upness, Paul is able to write to them and say, my love to you in Christ Jesus. As he calls them to Christ, they are still a community in all of their mess. And this is something that is so important for us because we often pursue church as consumers. Uh, I heard a sermon uh, listening to a podcast where a guy worded it like this. Most people like Sundays because they get a free concert and a TED talk. And the reality is that if we see it as a consumer and we view church like a running club where it's a superficial, uh, consumeristic kind of headspace, nothing's gonna change in our life because we need genuine, authentic, vulnerable community where things are messy so that I can grow and be transformed. 
if I find a perfect church, I will not grow. If you find a perfect church, it won't be perfect anymore, just by the way, as well. But the idea is that this messy, broken, not perfect community is what shapes me. And if I think that I need to find this perfect place, and it's not about a perfect place, again, that's, that's the consumer mentality that this whole world uh, conditions us into thinking because I need to find a place where I can be real with other real people, where we're taking steps to taking the mask off, lowering the walls, exposing the, the real who I am that's here, and trusting, and it's not always going to be a smooth ride because we are humans who have stuff. And the church is never the problem because, and I'm going to share some stories in a bit. The church is a place of love and care, but there's risk involved. Because when I risk in vulnerability and I risk bringing my stuff into the light, I'm risking that with people and that can fall flat and has fallen flat. And I know for many of you, but there's no ways that I can learn to be patient if I'm not doing that with people, with my stuff. And there's no way I can learn forgiveness, genuine forgiveness, if it's not with people in community. And there is no way that I can learn to be kind if I'm not doing it with people who need kindness. As I make a decision to say, Jesus, develop this in me. And this mutual we following Jesus together, hearing the words of Jesus, seeing the life of Jesus, and doing the same, I will not transform. I will not become like Jesus if I am not doing that. Now, 1 Corinthians. What is, there's that famous chapter of Scripture. Many of us know it. Uh, chapter 13 about love. Paul's just written at the end, my love to you. He's, he's, he's not saying airy-fairy things because 1 Corinthians 13 from verse four, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. Love is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Remember, he's writing this into possibly one of the worst local churches ever to existed. But what is he calling this community to? To loving each other. The, the response to what they were doing is lean into Jesus and love like him. And the joy is they've got people to practice patience with. Think of all the divisions. They've got people to try to be kind with as they're taking each other to court. They're practicing forgiveness as this church is dealing with open public sexual immorality. I mentioned that I've been in a number of different churches throughout my life, serving in various levels of leadership and different full-time or part-time capacity. And um, forgive me if I've shared some of this stuff with you, but especially through my later teens um, and into, into early adulthood, I was an incredibly angry human being. And uh, I was involved in a local church. And, and during that period, there was three different occasions where I was brought into an elders meeting for some church discipline. It was hard. But also during that same time, uh, my family was going through a number of hardships. Uh, there was not a single church camp that I missed or youth camp because of those same elders. And so those elders who brought me in and had to have very strong words with me and some of the situations were, were quite severe that they needed to speak to me about because of my public behavior on a mission trip that the church sponsored me to go on, I shared a tent with one of those same elders. 
during that same period of time, another family member of mine in a, in a church meeting, some of you know churches to have like AGMs where all the members gather and, and things like that. One of my family members was publicly disciplined on stage and we were blindsided by it. One of the most painful experiences as a family in that same local church to have to deal with what happened to us as, as a family and, and a very disillusioned time for us. Somehow we chose to stay in that community and a year later, both my parents were without work for a whole year. There was not a single day that we did not have food on our table because of that exact same community. And I, I was reflecting back on my season, particularly in that church and the way the church handled my family. And I was thinking, we were probably the family that the Lord brought to that church to teach that church patience and kindness. <laughs> that I was this thorn in the leadership side that they would go, how do we love this guy? This angry, like sometimes violent, outrageous guy. And so they bunked me with them in tents on mission trips and loved me and taught me grace and showed me unbelievable kindness. And I don't think I would have been here in my journey with Christ and in ministry if a church community didn't take our mess and, 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 and not know what to do with us, but just try to love us. And sometimes it was practical. Sometimes we would arrive home and there were bags of groceries at our front door because the church didn't always have the resources to come out of their care fund. It was people. And you know, I spoke about a public disciplining of my family. It was a vote. People went hands up, and those same hands came and arrived with groceries, experiencing some of the best and worst that church has to offer, but it still formed and shaped us like Christ. I had to learn to forgive and try and understand and journey and stay friends with some of those people who I am still today. Community gets ugly, but without it, we cannot transform. And we can't love unless we are loving in community. John 13, 34. A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Again, community, to follow Jesus means I move from me to we. To follow Jesus as he has loved me, so I love one another. I love my community. Where does loving community start? That's with you. No, no. It says you love one another. The onus of how I engage with community is on me. As he, Jesus, has loved me, that motivates me to step into community and love like Jesus. How has Jesus loved me? The fact that he knew everything that existed inside of my heart and everything that I'd ever hidden from everybody else, he knew and loved me still. That he died in my place for my sin. And, and, and one of the things we often talk about is for my sin and shame. Something that we gloss over is the shame that was involved in Jesus' public execution as he hung naked on a cross and died publicly when they even took a toilet scrubbing brush to give him something to drink in mockery of him, that shame is on Jesus. And because of that shame, I do not have to be ashamed of my life as I step into community. Because if I love like Jesus has loved me, he's loved all all of me without judgment. He's not gone, Craig, I don't love all of you. I love all of you. Craig, that thing you did in high school or that thing that you did uh, habitually behind closed doors, or the, 
No, he took all of that and died for all of that. And so as a follower of Jesus Christ, I stand here in the victory of Jesus, my sin forgiven, the Father loving me, but without any shame. Something that we do with shame is it's a self-imposed thing. And it's done out of fear and hurt. And so I understand why people have shame. Uh, I've lived with a lot of shame for large parts of my life, but realizing that in Christ, my shame is gone. And so for me to love like Jesus is I love like he loves and I don't look past or I don't uh, hold people's stuff against them and go, wow, you are really messed up. That doesn't exist in community. Steve spoke about it a few weeks ago. When it comes to following Jesus, he doesn't tell us to go get clean. Like you don't jump, you don't clean yourself before you get into the bath. The purpose of the bath is to get clean. Jesus says, come follow me. And that's when transformation happens, which is why in community, we drop the shame thing and we step into vulnerability. And this is where genuine love comes from in church. Because yes, we have a care fund and yes, we try to practically love people and we help with bills and we provide food and we try to practically love, which is important, but a greater care and love exists when I step in and I take the mask down and I step in and I lower the wall so I can let somebody see in. And when I can say, I don't have it all together. And then we have genuine community where people can love me and be there for the real me, not the pretend me that looks a certain way or acts a certain way in the hopes that no one will be able to see past the wall and see the real person that is there. The joy and love of community is that I get to love who you really are because that person is who Jesus loves. And that's the person that Jesus is calling into deeper community with people and into deeper transformation. And it is scary because for many of us, we have lived our whole lives masked up. And it is our primary defense mechanism and we don't let anyone in. But we will never grow. We will never experience the full life that Christ has given us if we are not transforming more into his likeness. And that comes from community. And and this is the invitation today. This is what we're inviting you into. And it might be terrifying. And there are a couple of of steps that you can think about this as as you take here. On a very practical level, stop leaving as soon as church ends. And if you're feeling offended that I'm pointing you out, this is community. Stay. Stay a little longer, and you make the move by going, hi, I am so-and-so. One of the mistakes is that somebody else has to make the first move. And again, that's not true, and that doesn't uh, foster community. You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're coming here, move from the concert and TED Talk to uh, increasing vulnerability in community and stay and talk to someone. That's at at a base level. And don't expect it to happen with somebody else. You make the move. The second thing is move from this big group to a small group. That might be like crazy. Craig, I've never gone to... I must rock up at a stranger's house, someone I don't really know, and then sit with a group of people around God's word and be real. That's what we're asking people to do because I cannot become like Christ if I'm not in community. So the more I wanna become like Christ, the more I have to step into community. The more I do that and create opportunities and go to places that exist for me to do that, I'm going to grow. And the last one, and maybe more terrifying one, is to be honest right here and now with where you're at. And Craig's gonna come up, he just will help with a bit of music as you start to process some of this. But I know maybe something in some of my stories have been triggering for you because of your past. That you were once vulnerable, you were hurt, 
And so the wall went up even higher and has not come down. Uh, I want to spend some time praying for you. For you feeling that you have a mask up, that you've got a wall up, that you live very specifically with, uh, I, can't, I, I can't let people see this. One, I, I can't. People know me. I've been coming to this church for 13 years. How can I let somebody know that I struggle with this? I, I was one of the first people here. How can, how can I let somebody in and know, what will they think of me? No, it's embarrassing. How can I let someone know that my marriage is falling apart? No, it's easier to pretend on a Sunday and let people think I've got a great marriage. When all you need to do is just reach out and and some of the people will love you and just be there for you and, and, and pray with you and care and show up. One of the things is, you know, when crisis hits, it's often people show up because you've been routinely leading into community for years. Showing up week after week, being in a small group week after week and, and following up on how your kids are doing and, and following up on, on things. And as you just routinely do community over years and years, you realize, shucks, my mom just died and people show up at the hospital. Well, how did that happen? It happened because you were here and you lent in. And that's when those real stories of community start to come up. But I specifically want to pray for people today who are afraid of the vulnerability, the embarrassment that comes up with somebody knowing that it's not going 100% with you, that you're struggling in an area, that there's, there's things that, that aren't going so great. And I'm not going to make this a a big thing, but just where you are, just close your eyes and pray with me. And I, and I do like um, this idea is that if this is where you're at, clench your fists. And your clenched fists is the, the fear of people knowing what's going on in your life. Your masks, your walls. And the step of faith is you opening your hands and trusting that Jesus would help the walls come down, that you can lean into community, that you can risk being vulnerable. And so as you're ready, you just uncurl your hands while I'm praying for you. Jesus, I am so grateful that while the world might condemn me for my actions and my past, you do not. And I don't need to be ashamed of my life as I'm trying to figure out what it means to follow you. That I don't need to be a perfect person to be one in community and to be loved. You loved me before I I knew anything. Before I was following you, you loved me. And you loved me in spite of And so I can bear all before you and know that I am loved. And Jesus, for every single person in this room that is carrying guilt and shame and condemnation about their lives and who are masked up and walled up from fear of people knowing what's behind and what's inside. Jesus, right now I pray that you would fill them with your love and grace and compassion and know that we do not stand before you ashamed, but unashamed in the love that you love us, that you forgive us. And so, Jesus, would you help us to be a community that is ever increasing in its vulnerability with one another, where we love without judgments and in boldness speak truth and grace as we mature together and be transformed into your likeness. And Jesus, I want to pray for healing for people who are masked up and walled up because they were hurt in their lives by church, by people people who followed you. Jesus, would you help them to learn to forgive like you forgive and so risk and love like you love. I'm really grateful for this, Jesus. In your holy name.